I thought it was you. Nice to see you, Dixon. It's been a while, Grandpa. One year, if my memory hasn't left me. Good to see you haven't kicked the bucket. <laughs> Put a sock in it. Wait. Dixon. Dunban. You're the heroes who risked your lives a year ago in the battle to defend the colonies. What's a pretty young lady like you doing hanging around with this bunch of slackers? Dunban, Dixon. Thanks for helping out back there. I don't believe we did anything. He's right. Savior, thanks for that giant bird. What was that thing? A telethia. A mystical beast that protects the sleeping Bionis. Though I've never heard of one ever venturing down to where us Homs live. Strange. A telethia? So that's what it's called. A mystical beast that protects the Bionis. So, what's your plan from here? Follow that metal-faced machine, I presume. What else? He's gonna pay for what he did to Fiora. Well then, there's only one place he'd go. Galahad Fortress in Sword Valley. A year ago, those things were building a huge fortress, right in the valley. Tactically, it's an excellent location to launch attacks from. I feel there's a strong chance they've now finished building it. That would explain why both colonies were attacked recently. Sword Valley, the very place where we made our last stand one year ago. So it's settled. Bash down a fortress and smash some metal brains. Easy rain. Shulk, there's somewhere else I need to go first. But what could be more important than... Wait, you saw another one. Saw what? What are you on about? These visions sound pretty handy. Well, out with it. What do you see? I was somewhere very high up. I was fighting at the peak of a huge tower. Fighting Metal Face. I heard a voice. And then the Monado's power was unleashed. His armor instantly gave way. The Monado doesn't work on Metal Face at the moment. But if that vision comes true... A tower, huh? Doesn't give us much to go on. Can you remember anything else from your vision? I remember... a huge horn. That's it. As I fought Metal Face, I could see the Bionis head. Prison Island. Prison Island? I've never been, but I've heard of a black tower at the head of the Bionis. They say it was built by the ancient High Entia race. The High Entia are real? I thought they were a myth. I wouldn't blame you, son. An ancient race living at the top of the Bionis? It does sound crazy. But Bionis is home to all kinds of different people, not just us. That includes the High Entia. The High Entia, huh? I dismiss them as folklore as well. Never assume anything. Seeing is believing, right? Have you ever met one? Well, yeah. Wow. Dixon, man, you're just full of surprises. What can I say? I'm well-traveled. <laughs> and it's all for your future. Day and night I've searched for new lands met new cultures, and gain knowledge for our people. The life of a wandering old fool. A lonely one at that. <laughs> Stop your whining. You do it because you enjoy it. And you make a tidy profit. Who asked you, Dunban? Well then, Shulk, what's it to be? We'll head there. There are alternatives. We could abandon the colonies, find a place the Mekon will not discover and live in secret. I realized something when we were fighting Zord. Wherever we go, they'll follow. We can't run from these things. We must fight on. I see. Then I am obliged to join you. You want to come with us? Scared I'll get hurt? No way! We know you're stronger than anything. Right, Ryan? You bet! I've recovered a great deal since we last met. And that miserly old coot over there made me this. Sharp. Light. Perfect for cutting through steel. Show me a mech on and I'll slice it in two. I might not be in peak condition, but I'm useful. I can't thank you enough. We're in it together now. You can count on us, Dunban. Miserly old coot. 
That sword is forged from Mechon armor. It's worth every penny. So you keep saying. If you want to go to the Bionis head, you'll need a guide to get to the upper regions. We're at the bottom, so I guess the only way to go is up. Right, but we'll need to go up the lower back first. The lower back? Colony 6 is right at the top of the Bionis leg, so we'll have to head around the waist. Through a place called Sartal Marsh. Follow me. It's time to begin our climb up Bionis. Hey everybody, it's Chugga Conroy. Welcome back to more Xenoblade Chronicles. Last time, we emerged from the Aether Mines, had a run in with Metal Face. Dunban caught up with us with his wounds finally healed, just in time to help us fight. This time, with our shiny new Dunben, shiny new Dunben, is that really how I want to word that? We're heading off towards the Toral Marsh, as Dixon told us, and speaking of Dixon, you might notice that he's been demoted to a guest, he is no longer fighting with us. Of course, the man who has the inability to die, and the inability to get toppled, thanks to his unique weapon, is not going to bother fighting with us, because, you know, we totally got it. And speaking of interesting little things about that, it is always going to be a stormy night whenever you go out into Colony 6 at this point. It is never any different. You might have noticed that my clock was daytime while we were fighting Zord, yet when we emerged, it was around midnight and there was rain outside. Just an interesting little thing that I thought was worth pointing out. Either way, we are heading off to the waste of the Bionis. We got this mist ahead of us. It's known as the Misty Path. We're a seasoned traveler, apparently, just like Dixon. Let's head into the mist and see what we find. I need to be right. even stronger. <laughs> Ryan, how dare you break this wonderful scenery by just going, All right! Either way, let's see what's ahead. Welcome to one of the fan favorite areas, and yep, it's one of mine too. I've never seen anywhere like this. You see? This is why I've been saying you need to get out of the lab every now and then. We're aiming to get inside the Bionis. We can get to the upper regions from there. Wow. I've never thought about going inside the Bionis. The closer we get to the top, the more monster trouble we're gonna run into. The only things I venture this far in are the Nopon merchants and curious types like me. You really know all the fun spots, eh, Dixon? <laughs> you want to get to the top? Then this is the only way. We'll push on, no matter what. That's the spirit, Shulk. Dixon, I don't doubt that you're a smart guy who's seen a lot of the world, but this was, what, a one-minute walk from Colony 6 and it's this friggin' pretty? I think a few other Homs living in the area would have wandered out this way just to see what all this glowing was all about. Just saying. Anyway, Dunban is new to the party, and we should really check him out. I know that Ryan learned a new art, and I do want to go over that, but I do want to switch over to Dunban just so we can see what he's all about. He starts off with eight arts, and uh, as for his skill trees, Bravery gives him 4% more counterattack rate, Wisdom gives him two more points in agility, and Prudence gives him 2% more on block rate. Well, what is Dunban like? What are his stats? Well, for that, I want to bring up the tutorial. And yeah, I know what you're thinking. Great, boring thing to bring up, right? Well, actually, no. I would really like to praise how the tutorials are handled here. They do an excellent job explaining things and do it in a really nice way. Right here, it doesn't look like anything special. It's just mentioning how his talent artist Blossom Dance. He press B in time with each slash, and he gets dragged up to four times. And, the, you know, his talent gauge fills up any auto attacks. But... We move on, and Ryan and Dunban are having a bit of a conversation, you know, contrasting how they work. Dunban's style is to avoid attacks, he does large amounts of damage. And Ryan is more about taking hits than dodging them. Dunban wants to wear light equipment so that he has higher agility. Ryan and I are both skilled at drawing aggro, but my technique is to perform attacks that cause heavy damage. Gems that increase your agility to be the perfect complement to your style, Dunban. But... Ryan uses all kinds of auras and effects to draw aggro, whereas Dunban just does heavy damage. In fact, Dunban is the strongest other than Shulk. So he's a bit less of a glass cannon. How about we try out Dunban on this acid ooper right here, and what a coincidence, it actually has an item we're gonna need in a bit. First off, Dunban has Gale Slash, and inflicts bleed, and it's important to his other arts. Why is this? Well, Electric Gutbuster inflicts break if used after it, and he also has a topple art. 
Yeah, not only that, but Worldly Slash will also inflict Strength down and Defense down if used after Gale Slash. So, very important art right there. With you around, there ain't no stopping us. Totally. Don't get cocky. Stay focused. Stay sharp. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> I love little moments like that. But yes, Dunban has a break art and a topple art all in one. He doesn't need any sort of teamwork or chemistry or any of that to get that done. Uh, is there another Upa in this area? Wait, what am I targeting? Oh, uh, uh, no, no, you can, um, you can, you can stay over there. You can do that. I, I don't want to bother you at all. Yeah, not really the best idea to have Charla out right here when you have this thing aggroing whenever you're using ether nearby. Uh, there are all kinds of nebula around here. Typically, you only find these in areas where it's raining, but because it's all foggy here in Satoru Marsh, you'll be finding them pretty much all the time. Uh, is there another Upa right there? Indeed there is. How about we try out his auras? His auras are actually really cool. Spirit Breath is good, removes all debuffs from Dunben, and it grants him haste so his auto attacks will go off more often. Really nice for drawing aggro and for building up that talent gauge. Now, Dunben's lock-on art is a variation of Rhine, so I don't really think I need to go into too much detail about how it works, but there's one major difference. Every time Dunban dodges an attack while the enemy is locked onto him, his talent gauge goes up, thus making it build up much quicker. So that's fine and good. Uh, I'm feeling really jerkish these Upas, which I really shouldn't because I like Wooper and Upa is Wooper's Japanese name. <laughs> Blinding Blossom just absorbs aggro from another party member specifically, you have to target one. And Peerless grants strength up to Dunban and will remove Confuse from the entire party. We haven't seen Confuse yet as a status though, so it's not entirely helpful yet. But that is all of Dunban's arts. He is great at dodging attacks. All around, I think he is one of the better party members. The fact that he has high agility is just a really good selling point because he... Like I said, agility is arguably the most important stat of all, and he is great at it. All that aside, I think I'll take out this Upa and meet you guys in just a moment. Now that that's done, how about we switch over to Ryan and check out what his new art is. Let's test things out in this Marsh Flamie right over here, just because it happens to be right in the way, and, you know, we might be doing a lot of battles, but, oh well. We gotta try out these new arts sometime, don't we? What better time than the present? He learned Shield Bash. That makes it so that Ryan can now inflict Daze as well, thus making it a lot easier to get things done in the way of Break, Topple, and Daze. As Dunban has both Break and Topple, Shulk has Break in Days, and now Ryan has a nice Topple in Days, can't talk. And then of course Charla has her own Break art. I'd like to switch up the party right here. A lot of people consider Ryan and Dunban interchangeable. I don't necessarily agree with that, but how about we switch in Charla so that we have a glass cannon, a tank of a different sort, and a healer. Sounds like a pretty good balance if you ask me, and I'm going to assume that literally everybody switched out Ryan for Dunban as soon as they got here. And get away from me, we're almost to where we need to go. Can you just not... Throw enemies at me, I'd like to take in the atmosphere. Everyone look. It's a group of Nopon. Ah, some Nopon merchants. What do you think they're up to? They must be here for a reason. Let's go and ask them. Good idea. Always ask the Nopon. The Nopon know all. They might be small, but they are powerful. All hail the Nopon. <laughs> okay, not. Nah, I'm just being goofy at this point. We don't need to take any stinking bridge. We can just jump off and walk through the swamp because we have jumping, as I always put it. <laughs> we got a Nopon merchant right here, and they have some pretty good items for us. Done by attacks using katanas, and we have one right here, a steel cutlass that has an empty slot on it. This is a more powerful weapon than what he already had, but it is not the anti-Mechon driver, so it will not be able to harm Mechon. So I recommend that you keep his other weapon around just in case. Pinehead Gear is something new. It has Terrain Defense 2. That makes it so that if you take damage from any sort of elemental hazard that is naturally in the environment, it'll be decreased by 20%. You might want to equip this to the party leader, because we're going to be having instances of that soon. The Speech Bangle will lower Dunban's defense, but give him a whopping 10 more points in agility than what he already had. If you don't have an agility up 2 gem to give him, this might be worth it. These Web Sandals have Chill Defense 4 on them. I don't think we've seen a level 4 gem on anything yet, not even unique equipment. That will make you take 14% less damage from Chill, which is a damage over time infliction. And as you would guess, with any new party member, the first merchant we see has all kinds of skill books for Dunban. Here's how the party's looking now. Shulk is looking really flashy in that pine headgear there. Dunban's looking just as cool as ever in his Johnny Depp attire. We got Charla there with those interesting looking sandals that give her chill defense and also some really nice stats. And Ryan is looking pretty darn flashy in his Skyrim helmet, I have to say. <laughs> Alright, so now that we got all that done, sun is rising in Satoral Marsh. Unfortunately, the phosphorescentness of the land is kind of starting to fade. Yeah. 
The daytime isn't quite as pretty as nighttime, but it's got its own charms. On the side, we have a Nopon merchant right here. This first time you come to Satoru? This place covered in fog all year long. It best not move around nighttime. Why not? It's so pretty at nighttime. I could deal with monsters and scariness if it means that it gets to be this pretty. So, detox frogs attacked, or detox frogs. Does that mean that you eat them and like they rid their body of toxins or something like that? I don't know. But what I do know is she has a monster quest for us, and like all monster quest givers, she has like a billion quests for us. We gotta kill some Kopi's quad wings right here. And while we're accepting all these quests, if you look down at the bottom bar, you might have noticed something. The area icon is different than it was before. Central Marsh is the first area in Central Bionis, so the affinity gained here is going to be for an entirely different place than before. And then we're just zooming along, we're already in the third region out of the affinity chart, so that's really cool. We got our very last quest here, we got to get an Officer Vulf in this monster quest number four. And if you talk to her again after accepting all those quests, listen to this, Central Marsh of connection to High Entia. Just like we were hearing before, there are lots of ruins everywhere. It might be fun to investigate. Talk to her yet again. She mentions the Sororal statues. They're really big, taller than a thousand Nopon, so roughly Shulk's height, right? <laughs> one on the right is Katoral, and the one on the left is Sultnar. So we have a bit of mythology and backstory for this area already, just from this Nopon merchant. Uh, this Nopon Bokoko over here has a bit of a quest for us, but uh, I don't want to do that quite yet. I want to be able to focus on that one completely. So uh, with the sun risen, how about we head deeper into the marsh, but not before grabbing this shiny. Oh! It was kind of odd, when he got that vision, like, his legs stopped moving and he just fell. Three of them would be warm indeed. So, wool rocks. Okay. Uh, wait. Oh, come on! An enemy attacked me while I was in the middle of a vision. Really? Okay, well, we need to hunt a Kofi squad wing anyway. What does Dunban do? Okay, fine. Sure. Go around that way. See if I care. <laughs> Hope you don't mind the cut there. I opted to just take out the Copus Quad Wings in this area because they are really annoying enemies, as in they will pop up all the time when you don't see them coming because they're up in the trees. Now, um, now that we're all done there, Ryan, uh, Ryan, uh, Dunban did get a level up. And uh, as we get up here, there's something I'd like to address. A lot of people ask the question, Ryan or Dunban, as they are both tanks. My answer to that is that they're better for different situations. Dunban is best at fighting enemies one on one, his high agility makes him better for fighting higher leveled enemies. And aside from that, Dunban is not really the greatest at fighting groups, because when he's trying to dodge attacks, when you have two or three enemies making it so he has to dodge twice as many or three times as many attacks, it can get stacked up pretty quickly and he doesn't have a whole lot of HP. Ryan, on the other hand, as you would guess, is better at fighting groups of enemies and getting the attention of them, as he can take a lot of hits head on. So, they're better for different situations, but what I want to say is, why not Ryan and Dunban? Now... This kind of gets into why I think Charles is not the greatest, and I've been waiting to talk about this for a while, and now that we have four party members, I can kind of do that. Now, before I say this, I will never tell you that Charlotte is useless. I have never meant to say that in any way, and I don't believe it is true. But, you know, with same level, same everything, except switching out Charlotte for Ryan right here, let's see what happens here when we don't have a dedicated healer, and we just can do loads and loads of damage really quickly. Look at how much faster this battle is going. This enemy's barely getting any chances to attack us. And of course, in Xenoblade Chronicles, you can heal the full health at the end of a battle. So, this brings up a bit of a question. What is better? Having a healer to patch up your wounds at the expense of damage output, or be able to take out enemies so quickly you don't even need healing in the first place? When you're having to kill lots of enemies for quests, or just get through an area that's packed full of regular enemies, I think it's pretty obvious which one you would want. But that's just it. That's what you want. You can't necessarily always have that. And that is th and that is why I will never tell you Charlotte is useless. Against high-level bosses or unique monsters and things like that, she does keep you alive. She does get you through situations you wouldn't have been able to get through without her. I know she definitely has done that for me already. And when you're fighting higher-level enemies like that, Problem is, is that that just doesn't come up as often as these other situations do. I feel like Shulk, Ryan, and Dunban are useful in way more situations than Charlotte is. And for that reason, I just don't use her as often as the other ones. She is not bad, and like I said, not useless at all. But that is just how I feel about her, and I think that should get across the point pretty well. Because you saw how much faster that battle was over. You see, these battles are just over before I even acknowledge their existence, really. And not only that, but Dunban's arts work remarkably well with Shulk and Ryan because of the color of his arts during chain attacks, and the fact that you have just so many break, topple, and daze arts between them that you can keep enemies toppled for a super long time. Either way, we have an either crystal deposit here that I wanted to show off, and that's pretty much it for my detour. 
How about we meet up again by that bridge next to the Napon Merchant Camp and head up for where we need to go? With all that questing and explanation out of the way, look ahead of us. That's where we're going. We're leaving from the Napon Merchant Camp, like I said. This might be a little bit redundant as we did walk through this area a little bit already, but I just wanted to leave from a nice, simple landmark that's easy to grasp, and I have to say, Satoru Marsh is a highlight of everyone's first playthrough. I liked this game a lot before this point, but this is where I got really hooked into it and it just absorbed my life for literal weeks, and I just could not put it down. Not just the environment and the creativity at play here, or even the fact that this blows away everything we've seen up to this point and what they're going to do with this world, but also the fact that- Whoa! I need to stop getting so freaked out at these visions, they just freak me out a little bit because I get startled and they interrupt what I'm doing. But What's been happening in the story at this point? Like I said, the Aethermine is where Shulk, Ryan, and Sharla really popped out to me as characters, especially Ryan. And I began to like them a lot more. I liked the characters before this point, but this is where they really popped out to me. And as for what happened in the story, the cutscenes in the Aethermines, and especially as we got out of the Aethermines, what's happened with Metal Face and the fact that we saw him again this soon, that all put me on the edge of my seat and made me want to see what happened next. And that's not even it. The fact that Dunban has joined us. I mean, don't lie. Back in Colony 9, you wanted him to join us. Everyone does. The fact that he actually joins you, you can play as him, and you're going to be seeing more of him, that gets you really hyped up. All these things happening right at the same time just always excites me. And getting to this point again always takes me back to my first playthrough, and I can never look forward to it enough. Well, these Ignas interrupted me at a pretty good time because I was pretty much done. Uh, I guess I don't really need to run from them, but we've done a lot of fighting already, so let's just do that. These things look like Argonians from Elder Scrolls. Wow, second Elder Scrolls reference this video. Can't believe that. But uh, there was one last thing that I wanted to say about Satoru Marsh and just this point in general. The music is one of the most loved songs in the soundtrack, and for good reason. In fact, how about I let the two of you get acquainted? Trust me, you'll like each other. I think that's enough. One of my favorite songs, hopefully it's now one of yours if it's your first time, and if it's not your first time, hopefully you enjoyed hearing it again. I know I sure did. But more into this area. Believe it or not, this area was foreshadowed. You could see it from the Bionis leg. Whenever you would look at the main body of the Bionis, you could see this ledge going around the waist of it, and it had these gray-looking trees just all clumped together around that area as it was going around the body. Yeah, this is it. You could actually go to that place, and this is that. If you want to see it, of course, I'll have an image on screen for those of you that didn't notice it back then. But yes, we are almost to where we got to be. Let's see what Dixon can tell us about this area. This lamp, it has a very strange glow. It's a remnant of the High Entia. They've hidden themselves away in the upper reaches now. But at one time, they controlled this whole area. Good for them. It's the perfect place to get some shut-eye. The lamp will keep the monsters away. We'll be safe if we rest here. Ah, oh, the breeze feels so good. It's so peaceful. You know, Shulk, I hope every day can be like this, always. No! You will pay for what you've done! The pain and suffering you caused the Emperor and Fiora! Do you wish to change it? The future? Has it been that long? Dixon. 
14 years since I found you on that mountain. Seems like yesterday. I owe it all to you. If you hadn't found me that day, I wouldn't be here now discovering the world. Forgive me, Shulk. Sorry I couldn't save you folks. Don't be. Now I think about it, that was when I found the Monado as well. This might be crazy talk, but maybe you and the Monado are part of some higher plan. I don't remember much at all. But I know that my mum and dad left me it. The Monado was their final gift to me. At least, that's how I used to think of it. That's why I want to discover its true power and help defeat the Mechon. But so far, I've just been creating piles of mech on scrap. So you don't just want to study it in a lab after all? This sword... There must be some way.